Well, good morning. Greetings to my friends in the basement. Great to be with you this morning. It's what a joy to be here in the house of the Lord, to worship him, to sing songs together, to fellowship. Um, Just such an incredible privilege. And I just want to mention, just before we jump into the word of God, uh, that there was one announcement that Harv forgot to mention. Uh, But just this week, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're going to be holding some prayer meetings here at the church at 730 as we've been discussing the possibility of uh, opening up a Christian school. And we just know that uh, before something like that would happen, that we need to give our attention to prayer. And so that's going to take place on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week at 730. And if you want to come join us to just pray, we're just going to seek the face of God over this matter. It would be fantastic for you to join us. Well, you can turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. If you haven't been with us, we've been uh, going through a series in the Gospel of Matthew, and we now find ourselves in this last section in chapter 17, which is another prediction that Jesus gave concerning his death and resurrection, along with a little story about a temple tax. So that's Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 through 27. And I'm reading out of the ESV translation. It says, and they were gathering in Galilee, or as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook And take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Our God and Father, we bow in your presence in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all of his labors that he endured throughout his entire life, whereby he secured an alien righteousness for us so that we would have a right standing with you, O God. Father, we thank you for the finished work of Christ. We thank you for his lovely character and all that he is and all that he means to us. And Father, as we come to this passage of Scripture and continue to reflect upon his personhood and the way that he interacted with people among whom he lived. Father, we pray that you would grant us wisdom as we live our lives in this corrupt, fallen world that so desperately needs Christ and so desperately needs the gospel. Father, we pray that the Spirit of God would illuminate this text to our minds, that we would understand it, and more than just understanding it, God, that we would seek to live our lives in light of its truth. Oh God, I do pray that you would be with me in these moments as I seek to deliver your word to your precious people. I pray, oh God, that the Spirit of God would speak through me and that these words would not land on deaf ears. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our section of scripture begins with Jesus foretelling his coming death and resurrection. Uh, This was the second time where he clearly predicted that this would happen. Now, the first time that he predicted that this would occur in unmistakable terms was back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, where it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem 
and suffer many things. So here in Galilee, as Jesus was gathered with his disciples to teach them, he once again spoke about his impending death and resurrection. Now, there really is only one notable difference that seems to be stressed between what Jesus said here and what he had emphasized the first time that he had spoke about his death and resurrection. The first time that he spoke about it, he emphasized the necessity of it, for he said, I must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things. But on this occasion, when Jesus spoke about his death and resurrection, he emphasized the certainty of it. This was something that was going to happen. He would be delivered into the hands of men, and they would most certainly kill him. There was no escaping death for Jesus. The hour of the power of darkness was fast approaching, and he knew that it would arrive because he knew that it was the will of his father for him to suffer in this way. Now, unfortunately, the disciples still didn't quite understand. They were still struggling to make sense of the idea that their Messiah would suffer and even die. And since the goal of his mission still remained shrouded in darkness and still remained a little bit murky to them, they were unable to receive the kind of comfort that they could have received. Because Jesus not only spoke about his death, but he also spoke about his resurrection. He spoke about the fact that he would rise three days later. And the reality of his resurrection really should have given them hope and provided them much comfort. But since they were so focused on trying to grapple with the idea of a suffering Messiah, they were left in a state of distress rather than hope. Matthew tells us that they were greatly distressed. And Mark tells us that they were afraid of asking him about the saying. But despite the fact that they were failing to grasp what Jesus was saying and despite the fact that they were experiencing heightened anxieties in those moments, we do also need to keep in mind that this was prior to the time when the Spirit of God would be poured out. And so it's important to point out that these fearful disciples did eventually become fearless because after everything was said and done, After Jesus had died and rose again, we do know that the disciples' distress was vanquished. No longer were they without understanding. No longer were they uncertain about his mission. Because after his resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit, their understanding of his mission had become so abundantly clear. In the aftermath of his redemptive work, they came to understand that Jesus had to die in order for sinners to be saved. And because they understood that Jesus had to die, it convinced them that his mission to die and rise again was an irrevocable certainty. In fact, we see Peter speak about the certainty of his death in his sermon at Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, Peter said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter rightly understood that the certainty of his death didn't just reach back to the beginning of his ministry when Jesus had first spoke about it, but rather it reached all the way back into eternity. Jesus was destined to die from before the foundation of the world. And so when the Jews had delivered Jesus up over to be crucified, we have to understand that it was all in accordance with the definite plan of God. So Herod and Pilate and the Jews and all their wicked actions, which they will be responsible for, was actually fulfilling God's agenda to a T. 
It was all predestined to occur exactly as it occurred. And Peter was someone who came to believe that with great conviction. Well, after Jesus had spoken about the certainty of his coming death and resurrection, Matthew goes on to describe something that happened while they were in Capernaum. And I want us to now take a look at verses 24 through 27, which is an event that is only recorded in Matthew's gospel. And so let's take a look at what happened here. In verse 24, it says, When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? According to this verse, there was a situation that arose while Jesus and his disciples were in Capernaum. And remember, at this point, Jesus and his disciples have been traveling south in order to go to Jerusalem, which means that this would be the last time that Jesus would visit this city known as Capernaum before his crucifixion. Well, while they were there in Capernaum, some tax collectors had come to ask Peter if their teacher was going to pay his taxes. Two drachmas was what he owed. And a drachma was a Greek silver coin that was roughly the equivalence of a Roman denarius, which was the value of a day's wages. Now, this was also known as the half shekel tax, a half a shekel being equivalent to two drachmas, which would be approximately the amount paid to a workman who put in two full days of labor. Now, keep in mind that this was not the Roman tax. These collectors were not people working for the Romans like Matthew was. This tax was a Jewish tax placed upon all Jewish males over the age of 20. It was an annual tax that would be paid every spring and all the proceeds from it would go towards the temple and all the upkeep that it needed. Now, this tax originally stemmed from a command that God had given to the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13. It was a command that stated that whether someone was poor or whether someone was rich, all Israelites or all male Israelites over the age of 20 were commanded to give half a shekel as an offering to the Lord, the proceeds of which would go in service to the tabernacle. But since the tabernacle tax, or since the tabernacle tax was a divine sanctioned law, what many people had come to believe was that after the tabernacle had been replaced by the temple, it was just assumed that the tabernacle tax would be transposed into a temple tax. And you can see how they would arrive at that conclusion. I mean, if God wanted us to give in support of the tabernacle, then it makes sense that he would also want us to give in support of the temple. And so that's what they did. And over time, it just became the normal standard procedure. Every spring, you just pay your taxes. And to not pay your tax basically meant that you didn't want to have anything to do with the religious community of Israel. And that to not pay it was seen to be highly offensive because it showed that you were not supporting the very dwelling place of God, namely the temple. And so when they asked Peter if his master was going to pay his taxes, Well, there wasn't any doubt in Peter's mind over what Jesus would do. Of course, Jesus would pay his taxes. Peter just assumed that Jesus would do what all other patriotic Jews did. But as we will see in the following verses, Peter's response was actually presuming too much. In the beginning of verse 25, it says, He said yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. Now, I need to stop right there for a moment because this is really quite remarkable to think about. Before Peter even had the chance to tell Jesus about these tax collectors coming for their money, Jesus was already aware of the situation, and the text tells us that Jesus spoke to Peter first. Now, whether Jesus knew what Peter was going to say because he had somehow overheard the conversation that he had had with them, or whether he knew about the situation because he is God and thus knows all things, is not directly specified. 
But it seems clear enough to me that he knew about the whole situation precisely because he is the God who knows all things. I think that's what Matthew is trying to emphasize when he said, Jesus spoke first, which is very unusual. Why did he speak first? Well, it's because he is the one who knows all things. Jesus knows what is in man. Jesus knows what people think. He knows what people say because he is the one who possesses infinite knowledge. He is God. Now, in the remaining portion of verse 25 and 26, we see Jesus present a little parable to Peter to teach him that he was under no obligation to pay this tax. Look at what he says. He says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Jesus' point here is that earthly kings are not obligated to pay their taxes And the reason why they're not obligated to pay their taxes is because the members of a king's family are maintained by the taxes paid by others. In fact, in the ancient world, sometimes there were even kings who wouldn't even tax their own citizens, let alone their own sons. Sometimes kings would just gather tribute from nations they had conquered or from vassal nations that were subservient to them. But the point is clear. The point is that the sons of the king are free. They are exempt. They are off the hook. Well, think about it. Who is Jesus? He is the son of God. Moreover, whose temple are they gathering for? Well, that would be Jesus' own father. Well, then Jesus is saying, look, my father owns this temple, and as his son, I am free from paying this tax. Now, that's the argument that Jesus used on this occasion, and it certainly is a very good argument. But, you know, I think that Jesus could have even gone further and expanded upon it if he wanted to. Because, after all, wasn't he also the temple? Wasn't he the one in whom the whole fullness of deity dwelt bodily? You see, when Jesus arrived on the scene, a redemptive historical shift was taking place. He was the new temple of God, replacing the old physical structure. And so if he wanted to, I think he very well could have said, Look, guys, I am the temple. So all this money, all this tax money that you're gathering for the temple actually needs to be paid to me. I think he could have said that if he wanted to. But nevertheless, surely Jesus' point was more than sufficient to defend his right over not having to pay this temple tax. The sons of the king are free. But what's amazing about this is that despite the fact that Jesus was not bound To pay this tax, we nevertheless see Jesus willingly lay down this right. Look at verse 27. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. You know, Jesus didn't have to pay this tax. He wouldn't have suddenly become unrighteous if he didn't pay this tax. He wouldn't have been breaking the law if he didn't pay this tax. And yet he willingly chose to go the extra mile to pay the tax because for him it wasn't worth causing offense over such a trivial matter. I mean, there are already enough people that were frustrated with him, and so he didn't want to increase that opposition over such a small issue as paying a small tax. You know, this is a verse in which we can clearly see the wisdom of Christ on full display. 
And it illustrates to us that being a follower of Christ sometimes means doing things that we aren't necessarily obligated to do in order to not become stumbling blocks in the way of the kingdom's advance. Now, we know that Jesus obviously never budged when it came to doing the doing the will of his father regardless of what people thought and no matter how much it offended them. But at the same time, we can see that he was willing to sometimes accommodate himself to certain cultural practices and procedures if it meant that people were going to have less of a stigma towards him. And by the way, I say sometimes because... We do have examples where Jesus and his disciples didn't always observe a particular practice, even though it did cause offense. An example of this is in Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus' disciples didn't observe the ritualistic practice of washing one's hands before they ate, even though it was part and parcel to the cultural norms of the day. In fact, Jesus used it as a lesson to teach the Pharisees about what truly defiles a person, and they were greatly offended by it. So we do need to be careful in how we nuance the application that we are to draw from Matthew 17, verse 27. Surely the application is not, you know, never, ever, ever do anything that offends anybody. Because there are things that we're going to do as the church of Jesus Christ that will bring offense. And we do have to realize that we live in a sinful world where many people have a corrupt understanding of justice and righteousness, which makes it necessary, even incumbent upon the church, to exercise its prophetic voice in speaking against injustice in a God-honoring way wherever the injustice may be found. If we're concerned about the preservation of truth, and if we're concerned about justice being carried out, and if we're concerned about loving our neighbor, and if we're concerned for the well-being of our children, then we can't simply shut our mouths for the sake of making sure that someone doesn't get offended. Because if you silence the church, then you've really snuffed out the only real beacon of light that there is. But, although that is true, here's what we also need to keep in mind as Christians. While there are some battles worth fighting for, which there are, there are causes worth fighting for. According to this verse, we can also see that there are some battles that are not worth fighting for. And I think that a heavy dose of wisdom is the needed ingredient to know how to respond in each circumstance. J.C. Ryle, in comment commenting on this passage, makes some very illuminating remarks. He says, God's rights, undoubtedly we ought never to give up, but we may sometimes safely give up our own. It may sound very fine and seem very heroic to be always standing out tenaciously for our rights, but it may well be doubted with such a passage as this, whether such tenacity is always wise and shows the mind of Christ. There are occasions when it shows more grace in a Christian to submit than to resist. Surely this is the kind of attitude we see exemplified in Christ as he paid a tax that he was under no obligation to pay, all for the sake of not offending people. In fact, we see the Apostle Paul follow the same pattern that was established by our Lord in this regard. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win them, or win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. 
To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul was willing to do certain things that he didn't have to do so that he might become a better servant to all. To the Jews, he willingly submitted to the dietary regulations of the Mosaic law, and when he was spending time with those Gentiles, he lived as one who was not bound to the Mosaic law. Paul was a person that was uncompromisingly committed to obeying the truth regardless of what people thought. And yet he was also more than willing to sometimes lay down his rights and put the interests of others above himself if it meant it would make him more productive in serving the interests of the kingdom. Moreover, we also see the same principle applied not only in terms of winning the lost in the world, but also in relation to the church. In Romans chapter 14, we see that there were disputes among some of the members over matters that related to the consumption of certain foods and drinks, which were things that the believers were lawfully um, free to partake of. But Paul's advice to the congregation was that they pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And to pursue what makes for peace means that we will show consideration towards the struggles and weaknesses of others. Now again, I would argue that people can even take this principle too far by applying it in ways that go well beyond Paul's intention. Remember, even Jesus and the disciples didn't always do everything they possibly could to ensure that they never brought offense to anybody on all occasions. In fact, there were times where Jesus actually didn't think it was worth doing certain things so that people wouldn't get offended. Another example of this was in the way he observed the Sabbath. We know that the Pharisees were offended By the way he observed it, or perhaps I should say in his lack of observance according to them. But Jesus didn't submit to all their traditions just for the sake of making sure that they didn't get offended. That's just not the way that Jesus lived. Now obviously Jesus was courteous, he was caring, and he was considerate. And from the text that we're looking at today, we can see that he did think it was wise to do certain things in order to avoid creating unnecessary offenses. But at the same time, he also wasn't going to allow the unreasonableness of people's views to dictate the way that he lived. Jesus wasn't a people pleaser in that sense. So it's not like Matthew 17, verse 27 can be taken as an all-encompassing principle that demands us to do everything that's humanly possible to make sure that you always please everyone and make sure that no one ever gets offended by your every word and action. To view it in that way is to absolutize a principle. It's to turn a situational principle into a binding law. But as we've seen, there are several examples in Scripture that would mitigate against viewing it that way. But let me say that be that as it may, the major point of application from these verses still remains clear. The principle of avoiding unnecessary offense is a principle that we are to think through thoughtfully and carefully and prayerfully as we navigate through the many issues that we are confronted with in this world. We are to be a people that considers the weaknesses of others. We are to be a people that make efforts to pursue peace and mutual upbuilding even when we don't see eye to eye. We are to be a kingdom-minded people that seek to be constructive and wise and Christ-like as we think through the many decisions that we have to make in this life. This was a principle that the Apostle Paul sincerely sought to apply in many different situations that he found himself in. And why did he live this way? 
Why was he sensitive towards the feelings of others? Well, it's because he was constrained by the law of Christ. He did it all for the sake of the gospel that he might win them. And in so doing, he was modeling what it looks like to live your life with the advancement of the kingdom of God and the building up of the body of Christ as your primary concern. Brother, and we would all do well to allow those six words that were spoken through the lips of our Lord to rest upon our souls. Jesus, are you going to pay your taxes? I don't have to. However, not to give offense to them, I will. Well, after Jesus told Peter that he would pay the temple tax so as not to bring offense, he then told Peter to go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now, this was a miracle in itself. Jesus told Peter to go cast a hook in the sea, so he didn't even have to cast a net into the sea this time. And the first fish he caught would have a shekel, or he would catch, would have a shekel in its mouth, which would be just enough to pay his tax and Jesus' tax. This is a miracle that shows us the absolute sovereignty of God even over the fish of the sea. I mean, if the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord and he can turn it wherever he wills, as the Proverbs tells us he can, then it's not a problem for him to control the fish of the sea. To think about the supernatural providence of God in making this happen is just remarkable to contemplate. Think about it. Peter, out of the millions of fish in that sea, There is one of them that has a shekel in its mouth, and I want you to go get it. And by the way, you don't need to figure out which one has the shekel. You just need to go cast your hook in the sea, and I'll make sure that the first one you catch has that shekel. That is absolutely astonishing. And surely the success of Peter's mission here did not rest upon the free will of the fish. It rested upon the power of God. You know, Matthew 17, verse 27 is a verse that reveals to us the absolute sovereignty of God and control of God over the smallest things in the universe. And what a comfort that should be to us. I love what R.C. Sproul once said. He said, if there is one single molecule in this universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. Thankfully, Scripture assures us of God's sovereignty and affirms that no atom or molecule is outside His control. These truths can bring us great comfort, especially in times of suffering and uncertainty. Church, Every time that we see God providentially and supernaturally work things out to accomplish His will on the pages of Scripture, it should provide us much comfort and grant us much hope as Christians because it is another reminder that the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. It is a reminder that the hands of God are never tied up It is a reminder that God is freer to do what he wants than we are. Indeed, it is a reminder for all those that love God and are called according to his purpose, all things will work together for good. Well, we've seen some pretty amazing things from this passage, haven't we? From the sacrifice of Christ to the wisdom of Christ to the sovereign control of Christ. We have once again seen Christ in all of his glory, and it has shone bright and clear. And what important lessons there are for us to learn from it. May God help us 
to wisely apply his word to our own lives as we seek to live in accordance with his will. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we bow before you and we thank you for the richness of your grace. We thank you for the example of Christ. And God, I pray that you would help us all, uh, Lord, to just seek to live our lives after the pattern that he has established for us. Oh God, would you pour out an extra measure of grace that we might do your will and that we might do it well. God, help us from being focused on self, that we might be focused on the glory of God. And whatever that means we must do, may we submit to you for your name's sake. Father, we pray in these perilous days that the kingdom of God would advance in this world and that you would use your church as a beacon of light to proclaim the gospel to this needy world. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.